and um, we'll just move on to Adam Herring. So um, if I can get you to take your presentation down there, Kylie, and um, I'll introduce Adam. He's, we get a double header of Adam here. Um, Adam completed his vet degree in 2012 as part of the inaugural class at the University of Calgary's Vet School. Congratulations to Adam. He also worked for me for a summer. Um, after that, he spent a year in mixed practice before beginning his PhD at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan where he completed the work he will present today. He defended his PhD this past April and currently splits his time between wildlife contract work and small animal clinical work while he works on publishing his studies and prepares for the next career opportunities. Adam, I see we have you up here. And um, if you want to just go ahead, that will be great. Can't hear you, Adam. Are you muted? There we are. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay. And now you can probably see my screen. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I'm going to be occupying the next 30 to 40 minutes or so of everyone's time. And I'm going to take a slight shift in gears here from the Movi heavy discussion that we've all been having to a different pathogen of our bighorn sheep friends, Seropthes. Um, and so obviously Seropthes has gained a fair bit less attention in this presentation, in, in this symposium and in many in the past because it doesn't seem to have the same kind of major impacts on uh, wild sheep populations that pneumonia does, but suffice it to say, it can still be a significant factor and if nothing more um, can drive some population trends and be a welfare concern as well. So. We'll just go ahead here. I'll start by giving you a bit of background about the pathogen Seropthes and then the Canadian context. This was brought to my attention um, when I approached Dr. Schwancha in BC to ask her if she had any potential projects that I could work on. And she noted that Seropthes was a relatively new arrival in a particular area of Southern Canada and could use a bit of attention. And then we'll talk a little bit about the objectives of this first research project that I'll talk about, some of our methods, and then our results and implications of those results. So Seropthes is a non-burrowing ectoparasitic mite. Um, it's known to affect numerous different host species around the world, but is most well known for causing sheep scab and domestic sheep. It's recognized by these long jointed pretarsi. So that's how it's separated from other mite species microscopically. You can see one of those long jointed pretarsi in this photo here. It, the different species of Seropthes have traditionally been differentiated by several different factors, including the host species that they infest, the location of the infestation on the host, the length of something called the outer epistosomal setae, on mature male mites. But there's been debate in the literature about how much cross infection there could be and how real it is that there are different species of Seropthes in the environment versus different ecotypes maybe or, or different morphologic presentations of um, individuals within a single species. Many authors would argue that it should just be unified under the name of priority, the first described species being Seropthes ovis, uh, described in 1813 by an author by the name of Viborg. In the, the Canadian context, so Seropthes has been seen in American bighorn sheep throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. The parasite was eradicated from Canadian domestic sheep in 1924, and it's been hypothesized that Seropthes was probably brought over to North America on domestic sheep. It was first officially identified in our Canadian wild bighorn sheep in 2011 with reports of potentially symptomatic animals dating back as far as 2005 sort of range. It was, it has been seen in the Okanagan population of bighorn sheep. Um, and it was the, to give an indication of what impact it may have had in that population. It was the population that's affected had a population of about 450 individuals in 2006 and the population most recent counts suggest that it's below 250 now 
So certainly not the massive die-offs that we see with pneumonia, but the population is trending down and seropathies might be one of the driving forces of that. For those of you not from BC, this is where the Okanagan is down there, right close to the border with Washington state. Um, and the animals that are affected are particularly the animals that are on the west side of this little yellow line here. This is a, a, a highway with a large fencing system. And so the animals to the west of the highway are the ones that are affected with seropathies, and the animals to the east of the highway are not known to have any seropathies. We haven't found any in that population. And until a movie outbreak very recently um, had, had been doing quite well. So um, there were a few hypothesized potential sources of that outbreak in, in the Okanagan population. One being natural movement of bighorn sheep between herds. So we'll zoom in on some of those populations that we're looking at. This arrow here points to the currently seropathies infested herds. And this arrow points to the next closest bighorn sheep herds in the US. The area between those is about 250 kilometers and there's some large waterways. So it seemed improbable, but probably not impossible that that would be the source. Another always potential option is maybe contaminated wildlife capture equipment. And then third was the idea that maybe there was another host species such as rabbits that could have had seropathies and transmitted the parasite over to our wild bighorn sheep. So for our methods, we looked for samples of seropathies from three different host groups. First being the outbreak associated bighorn sheep that are mostly in Canada, but also across the border into Northern Washington state. And we managed to get six samples from those animals. Next was historically affected USA bighorn sheep populations. So we got a couple samples from Nevada and from Oregon and from Idaho throughout the Hell's Canyon area and central Idaho. And then finally, we got we did a lot of work to try and get any rabbit seropathy samples that we could find. And it was quite hard to get any. But we did get one from Alberta, one from BC, and one old archived sample from um, Wyoming. I'm not sure actually where the Wyoming sample came from. It just came from their lab and they didn't have records of where that sample originated. So for our morphologic aspect of our traceback, we looked at a paper from 1990 by Boyce et al. And they measured a number of different morphologic characteristics of the seropathies mite that you can see here. And they found two of them to be the most discriminating between different source host populations. One being that outer epistosomal sete length that I mentioned, and that's highlighted there. It's the third hair from the midline on the epistosomal lobe. And then if you zoom in on that, you have the picture here on the left and this lateral margin of that epistosomal knob or lobe being another factor that seemed to discriminate different host population sourced uh, parasites. So you can see in this photo here, the rabbits are segregated in uh, the triangles circled by the red circle here and the bighorn sheep sourced mites are circled by the blue circle. And you can see that they do have a little bit of overlap in terms of the length of those epistosomal sete and the length of that lateral knob length, um, but they, they mostly do seem to segregate. But in that paper, because of the significant amount of overlap, they noted that alternative methods such as immunological or molecular characterization need to be explored to further clarify taxonomic relationships between seropathies, species, mites on different hosts. Of course, that paper was 30 years ago, and there are lots of wonderful techniques available to us now that were much less accessible at that time. So for our methods, we did measure those two different factors, the epistosomal sete length and the visual and the, a visual comparison of the lateral lobe of, of that uh, epistosomal knob. And we also did some molecular sequencing. We looked at two different genes in the mitochondrial DNA, the cytochrome B and the cytochrome oxidase subunit one. And we compared those as well with a sample that could be found on GenBank that was of Seropthes caniculi, which is was traditionally the name ascribed to seropathies found from rabbit hosts. And so the first stage was to separate out the mites that we had in our samples, the larvae that you can see on top there, or the female mites that weren't valuable for morphologic uh, 
differentiation were sent off for a PCR and the male mites, the adult male mites, you can see on the bottom left there with these epistosomal lobes were separated off and loaded onto microscope slides for that measurement. In terms of the numbers that we were successful in looking at, you can see there are eight USA bighorn hosts represented, six Canadian bighorn hosts represented, and three rabbit samples represented in our morphologic or morphometric measurements. And then you can see the number of mites between those that were represented. And then in terms of our PCR, we were a little bit less successful, but we did manage to get a number of successful DNA segments from the USA and Canadian bighorn mites. And we also, for two of the rabbit bighorn mites, we got um, successful amplicons from, for just the cytochrome B locus, but not the um, cytochrome oxidase subunit one. So starting with some of the, of the optical comparison, you can see quite a prominent difference. This is the Canadian bighorn sheep in the middle. You can see they do have quite a shorter lateral aspect to that epistosomal lobe that's much more like that found in rabbits. Um, and then the bighorn sheep being a fair bit longer. These are quite characteristic samples that you can see here. And similarly, the epistosomal sete length, we can see that the Canadian group or the, uh, I should say outbreak associated because they're Canadian and Northern Washington, um, had very similar episoso uh, outer epistosomal sete lengths as did the rabbit group and the historic USA bighorn mites were significantly longer in general. This is one example of the, the cytochrome B oxidase subunit, uh, the cytochrome B oxidase amplicon. And you can see the comparison drawn up here with most of the locuses being identical, but a few differences. And in general, the USA group, which is this second to bottom line, historically affected animals were generally different on a point by point basis compared to the Canadian bighorn sheep and the rabbits. And so that added significant further strength to the conclusion that our seropties that we have in the Canadian outbreak associated animals are much more closely related to the rabbit mites that we compared them to than they were to the USA bighorn mites. So that was um, quite interesting and, and uh, a little bit surprising. I kind of expected that it would have come from bighorns one way or another but it turned out that that wasn't the case. So this is looking at the percent homology, how similar our amplicons were between the Canadian bighorn sheep and the rabbits versus the Canadian bighorn sheep and the USA bighorn sheep. And you can see our Canadian bighorn sheep or, or our outbreak associated bighorn sheep rather um, being very, very similar to the rabbits, both in terms of the base pair similarity and the amino acid similarity and a little bit more difference between the Canadian or outbreak associated bighorn sheep and the historically affected USA bighorn sheep. For the other, um, the other locus, as I said, the rabbit wasn't successful. We weren't successful in getting any amplicons from the rabbit for the second locus. So we had to compare our outbreak associated bighorn sheep with the um, GenBank sequence. And we can see again, that is a little bit um, less clear in terms of similarities, but the Canadian or outbreak associated bighorn sheep is slightly more similar to the GenBank sequence than it was to the historically affected USA bighorn sheep. So in terms of conclusions, it seems uh, quite conclusive that the Seropti's outbreak from our Canadian bighorn sheep came from rabbits. After a little bit more digging, it became um, clear that the very likely source of that infestation in our Canadian bighorn sheep would have been this facility called the Okanagan Game Farm, which was closed in 1999. I, I should note that at the time of closure, um, Dr. Helen Swancha investigated and, and examined the bighorn sheep and none of them had clinical symptoms of steroptes and none of those animals were simply released. But when I interviewed people that had worked in the facility previously, they did comment that there were feeder rabbits that had been used in that area for feeding carnivores that had seropties or, or that had been seen having mites that um, align with 
the clinical signs we expect of seropties. I, they didn't have any record of them having been microscopically confirmed to be seropties. So I'm presuming that they likely were. And, uh, and they also noted that bighorn sheep were known to have escaped from the Okanagan game farm. And there is reports of them going on to form a wild population, some of the escapees of that Okanagan game farm. So it seems likely to me that the infestation probably moved from bighorn sheep over to, or sorry, from rabbits over to bighorn sheep, maybe on some contaminated feed or, or bedding material or something like that. And I think it's likely that this game farm facility created an unnatural closeness between those species to allow that parasite transmission to happen in a way that would be far less likely to happen in a wild environment. Um, and, and so I think with that, it's unlikely that rabbits continue to constitute an ongoing spillover threat. We did try to solicit any hair, wild hair samples from the Okanagan area, but we weren't able to get any. So that would have been an extra little piece of information that would have helped tie that whole story together. So we're at about 15 minutes here. This is my literature cited that was discussed throughout. And I would be happy to take any questions before we move on to the next presentation, if there are any. Great, thanks, Adam. It's great to see some parasitology happening and looking under a microscope. <laughs> I know how tedious it is. Um, it can be. I don't see any burning questions right now. Um, so maybe what we can do is move on to your next one and you can entertain questions on both after the next one. Sounds great.